Hey, uh, I'm Paul, and uh, I want to first thank Gregory for inviting me to Saskatoon. Um, and for the great opportunity to show bathers at night, I also want to thank Rose um, for her great work in helping me realize this installation. And everyone here, actually, Troy and Jason and Chad and Sandra and Sandra and Brittany and Mohammed and Ebner and Glenn. Have I missed anyone? Uh, um, Theo McCools. They've been very kind to me and our crew. Uh, I want to thank Nick and Alexa, Alexa West and Nick Calabrese, who uh, works for me for uh, being here. And I want to especially say a thank you for Alexa for uh, her catching a gigantic whitefish today at a lake at 12, 20. It was 15 pounds <laughs> and I think like 36 inches. And I'm a little sleepy from eating from it, actually. Um, uh, anyone else to thank? I just want to say how uh, hospitable everyone has been. Uh, I'm reminded of a word, an ancient Greek word called zenea. Zenea is roughly translated as kindness to strangers and hospitality. The word xenophobia is derived from the word zenea. Zeus, the father of the gods, uh, was considered the protector of strangers. And um, it's a remarkable idea that we should protect strangers and be kind to them and to be hospitable to them. And I think it's important to re remember that. Um, and it's odd that we have to think about Zeus in relations to hospi uh, being hospitable, but it's true. So um, with that, I think I'll just start. Cool? Can everyone hear me? Great. If you can't, let me know. So, I just want to start by, uh, I think tonight's basically a story. Uh, and uh, I want to tell you the story about how I came to make these peculiar works that I call breathers. Um, and I want to do it by focusing on one of the breathers that I've made, that I've nicknamed Bender. Every breather I make, I nickname. So downstairs at the installation called Bathers at Night, which is the entire piece, there are uh, seven what I call breathers. And I nickname them so that I can tell them apart and so that Nick and Alexa knows um, what to adjust and who to adjust. So for instance, we have Gwen. Oh, wait. I have a laser pointer. <laughs> this is Gwen. She's at, named after Gwen Stefani. This is Arnold, after Arnold Schwarzenegger. Kim and Chloe, you know who they are. <laughs> Twiggy Popo, which is shorthand for the police in the US. Uh, this is Stormy. We all know who Stormy is, right? And this is Christian. Uh, Bender isn't in this composition, but I want to focus on Bender because it's close to my heart, and I'll, you'll find out why. Uh, in a bit. So each of them I nickname and um, what I hope is that by telling you the origins of one of them you'll get a sense of how all of them are made. Uh, because they're different insofar as they're the same. They use the same principles and there's a, there are variations to the development in thinking but in general they're the same. And so uh, I'd like to tell you the story of how I made Bender. And uh, in general, I'd also like to talk about how this idea of telling one thing and how this one thing can illuminate a whole series of things is not unlike the word Genesis. Uh, the word Genesis, as we know, uh, is essentially uh, an idea about a story about a beginning of someone or something, or perhaps everything, if, uh, if you're religiously predisposed to that tradition. But in the fullness of the concept of the idea of Genesis within a particular theological tradition, Genesis is not only the word for a story about something beginning, but also a word about an idea of a story of generations. And so within the concept of Genesis, not only you have the idea of something beginning, telling a story about how something begins, but you're also telling a story about how 
the beginning began and how that beginning begot new beginnings and what those new beginnings, how they relate as a seed of that first beginning. And I think that's an incredibly rich concept, Genesis, in the fullness of this theological tradition. And, you know, I'm not religious, uh, but I like that idea. I like the fullness of it. And I like to think that, you know, I don't think there's anything more divine than a great cup of coffee in the morning. But I think even someone as um, undivined as me can sort of appreciate that kind of concept. So with the idea of Genesis in mind, uh, I'm going to tell the story of how I make the bender. So this is Bathers at Night. Uh, it was started uh, last summer. And um, and um, it's all I've made. Uh, the general, the general uh, category of the works are called breathers because uh, that's what I think they are. They are breathing artworks. They're used by uh, me creating the fabric shapes that is then attached to a fan that blows upward, and it's the breath of the fan that makes them come alive. They're enlivened by the air pressure uh, inside the fabric pieces. And the work it takes is uh, my capacity to imagine a shape and also the movement of each of these figures. Um, the challenge is always to animate in such a way so that just by the internal air pressure of these figures that they animate either this way or that way or this way or any which way uh, I want. I'm trying to animate essentially with air. I consider them clothes for spirits insofar as I'm designing clothes for just air, air movement. How did it start? And you're going to have to forgive me. I haven't talked about my own work since 2009. So I might be a little rusty. And if I'm too rusty, will you let me know? Thank you. No, you won't let me know. OK. You're so nice. Thanks. Um, November 2013, uh, I happened to be in the studio space, space of artist Rachel Harrison a great artist in her own right. And I was in her space just um, lounging around. And she had left stuff around. And uh, one of the things she left around was uh, an old fan. This is it. Uh, the fan was broken. It still worked, but it only pointed upwards. And so it only blew air uh, up to the ceiling, which I thought was curious. And the curious thing about this curiosity is that I couldn't take my eyes off this fan. Uh, and I didn't know why. And I think uh, it's because it reminded me of these. Uh, these are called, I think, the, I think the copyrighted name for these are called Sky Dancers. And I think I'm pretty sure we've all seen them at used car dealerships or perhaps at malls. Uh, the principle of these Sky Dancers are essentially what I, how I described to you with uh, the breathers. There's a fan, and then there's a fabric piece that is uh, connected to the fan, and they try to get your attention. They're built for attention-arresting uh, perception. And uh, the fan, so the broken fan in Rachel Harrison's uh, studio reminded me of these. Um, I think the reason why uh, I paid attention to that fan, and I kept thinking about the fan it, in hindsight, was that I was looking for something. And what I was looking for, I realized, was a way to cheat my own fate. Uh, you know, I think believing in fate is kind of like believing that the earth is flat, in a way. I'm not sure if anyone believes in fate anymore. Uh, but I think there are ways to think about the idea of fate that doesn't have to do with supernatural or divine beings lording over us from above or below. I think you can think about fate, and it's a tradition of thinking in early 20th century. You can think about fate as a form of authority. The police, for instance, or political representatives are forms of authority. But pre-existing uses and meanings are also, also a form of authority, insofar as they influence us 
to uh, think about something in a particular way or to legitimize uh, uh, certain ways of thinking and doing and in the process delegitimize certain ways of thinking and doing. And so fate in many ways is simply a kind of an influence of a past or a tradition so that we are sort of directed towards a way of doing and thinking about people or things. And um, I believe in this kind of fate. I think it's true. Um, I felt like I was fated to be something because of my parents or my schooling. And I think this is a general commonsensical feeling that we have, that based on our past, we are directed towards to do something particular. And if we accept it, we accept our fate. But if we don't, what happens? I was looking to cheat my own fate. And the interesting thing about it is, I was trying to cheat the fate that I had created for myself, insofar as I had become a certain kind of authority of myself. And what I mean by that is um, that I have been very lucky that I started showing artwork in the early to mid-2000s. And I was very grateful for the opportunities. Uh, and the opportunities offered to me as an artist was because people were interested in the kind of work that I was making, which was mostly digital animation and video works works that would be projected on giant screens like this, or on specially built small screens like this. This is an earlier work that I did that was premiered in 2003 called Happiness After 35,000 Years of Civilization after Henry Darger and Charles Fourier. I'll just show you a section of it just to give you a flavor of it. goes on for 17 minutes on this specially built screen that floats in the middle of a room. I love this work. Um, I cherish it. It took me years to make. Animation is thankless work. You stare at a computer screen for 20 hours for, what, a minute and a half of visuals? And I did that for years, and I loved making that work. Um, but I couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't do it anymore. And there were many reasons for that, and I'll just tell you one of them. Uh, one of the reasons is because I think the nature of screens have changed for me and for everyone else. When I was making this work in 1999 to 2003, um, screen works were still more or less special. There were still, uh, screens weren't as ubiquitous as they are now. Back then, video projections, giant video projections, still felt new as an art form. Today, your smartphone can play HD videos, no problem. Today, video projectors, uh, projectors can project onto sides of buildings with the same resolution as you would get here. We are drowning in screens. And um, I couldn't bear the thought of making work for a screen anymore of any size. And I think that was the fate I was trying to cheat because I had been known as someone making screen works, but now I can't bear to look at the very format that I make work on that I made a living in. And so what the hell am I gonna do? This is the very first breather that I made based on that fan in Rachel Harrison's studio. I didn't know how to sew. I've never made a sky dancer. I didn't know what I was gonna do, but I thought, well, why not give it a shot? So in December, um, sort of a couple weeks after I uh, was obsessed over this fan, uh, uh, my assistant Cassie and I sewed this, uh, the first breather. It was made out of um, 1.9 ounce white ripstock nylon fabric that we got at the fashion district in the 30s in New York. And I, this was my first pattern. I had never drawn a sewing pattern before. And so this was how I, does anyone sew? Does anyone do pattern making here? I saw one hand. Do, do you, does this look right? More or less, <laughs> you're being too, too kind. Um, this is my first pattern. And so this is what I drew. And this, this is what I, we sewed. We taped it on with duct tape and uh, hoping that it would stay. And we, we strapped it on and uh, this is how it animated.
you're laughing. <laughs> it's certainly not as attention arresting as the sky dancers. <laughs> Physically, there are a couple things. They're not wrong, uh, but they don't function. There's, first of all, there's no outlet for the air. So in this breather, this very first breather, the air goes into the body and then comes back out in the same way, right? Uh, second thing is it's too heavy. There's a, there's a leverage point in the, in, the, uh, in the waist area, and that's why it's bending, right? So in a way, it's completely wrong. But I couldn't let go of this picture either because what I loved about it was that it was tired looking. That sky dancers generally are on uppers. They're, com they're, they're meth heads, basically. They're visual meth heads. And they're trying to get your attention to get it come in to buy a used car, right? But this one is the opposite. This guy's on downers and probably having a heart attack or closer to my heart, an asthma attack. And I think in a way it endeared me to this guy that I eventually nicknamed Bender. That's why I called it Bender. Bender became the first step in a long series of impossible steps uh, that I took that I'm still taking to make these breathers. And, uh, and I just wanted to list them out for you, it, perhaps even for myself. Like I said, I've never talked about the breathers publicly. We actually just premiered them last year at uh, Green of Tali Gallery, more or less. And so it was interesting for me to sort of um, quantify exactly what I had to go through to make a breather. And so these are, this is just a list of them. First and foremost is fluid dynamics. Uh, fluid dynamics is the study of flow of liquids and gla gases within uh, uh, shapes and containers. It's a branch, it's a branch of physics that helps pr uh, measure and predict the flow of liquids and gases like air. And um, in order for me to do what I thought I needed to do, which was to imagine that I can control these sky dancers, my sky dancers, like Bender, so that not only could it do this, but it could just do this or that, have the, essentially the same control that I had when I was animating on a computer, I thought I had to learn fluid dynamics. And in fact, I went to a scientist at NYU to talk to them to see if they were willing to help me figure this out, and 25 minutes later, they threw me out the office because no scientist was going to help an artist figure out animations that sold used cars. And so I was kind of on my own. I don't know fluid dynamics at all, um, but this was a branch of uh, uh, knowledge that I had to get familiar with just a little bit. Uh, other ones include sewing. I had never sewn before, ever. I mean, I did hand sewing. Did I even do hand sewing? I don't remember. I've never sewn before. Pattern making. So not only do you have to sew, but you have to make the patterns, right? Because then you can help, you can get other seamstresses to help you, like making clothes. You have to design the pattern so that the fabric could be cut so that we can test them. And it's a whole language, pattern making. It's like learning Spanish or French. Uh, understanding of fabrics. The world of textiles and fabrics is, is infinite. And um, the kind of fabric that I'm using, which is ripstock nylon, is only one type of a gazillion kinds of fabrics that one can use if one were to explore the idea of making these figures with different weights and fabrics to change and choreograph the motion. I had never worked with fabrics. Geometry, I wish I stayed awake in high school. I wish I stayed awake in any school, frankly. Um, geometry is very helpful in pattern making, insofar as pattern making is essentially a sub-branch of geometry, the understanding of shapes and how they fit together so that a two-dimensional piece of paper can be sewed together to create a three-dimensional shape. Fan mechanics. There are essentially four types of fans in the world. I'm just using one, it's, which is actually different from the sky dancers. Those blower fans are mechanically different in how they how they uh, force air through the motor than the fans that I'm using, which is centrifugal fans. But understanding that allows me to understand how much air pressure I can get so that I can create that animation. 
basic electrical work um, because the fans are electrical. And I have to know, like to this installation, we had to test the outlets. It's a great building. It looks great. Everything functions. But because the fans need a certain amount of juice, Alexa had to check the outlets to make sure the voltage was correct so that there's enough air pressure going through. And we found, in fact, two outlets that had weak voltage um, on the floor of the Connect Gallery, which was very important to understanding why certain figures weren't moving right. Because I can tell instantly if one of the breathers aren't moving right. Meteorology. Air pressure changes. Barometric pressure, humidity, wind speed, all those things contribute to how these breathers move and animate. And I had to learn the basics of how air, the weight of air, changes based on certain meteorological conditions to predict, to be able to predict how they're going to move, even if they're indoors in a climate-controlled environment. I, again, I don't know any of this stuff. I'm just telling you this stuff I ought to know. The last but not least is an ancient Greek word called polytropos. Um, I know this word more than any of these things. Polytropos is how uh, Homer described uh, Odysseus in the Odyssey. Uh, Odysseus has been described in many ways, and they're all derived from a translation of the word polytropos. Uh, older translations of the Odyssey uh, described him as wily or crafty. Uh, one of the most recent translations of the Odyssey described him as cunning. Polytropos can be described as uh, infinitely cunning or many-wayed. And that's how Odysseus escaped to go home. And uh, for me, someone who likes, um, who appreciates philosophy for its drama and comedy, I like this word a lot. And um, I feel like in order for me to do this kind of work, I had to be polytropic to be many weighed, and in many ways, cunning. I started making um, the breather's work um, after the first bender. It was two years of R&D, basically. Sewing, learning how to sew, learning how to make patterns, learning meteorology, learning a bit about fluid dynamics, testing different fans, over and over and over. And, um, and soon, um, in 2005, I started showing some of them in, uh, when opportunities arose. Uh, I first showed one at the Guggenheim in March of 2015. Um, I was awarded the Hugo Boss Prize. And as part of, um, part of my sentence, um, I was, uh, I was uh, given an exhibition at the Guggenheim. And typically, with Hugo Boss Prize winners, they want to do um, a kind of mini retrospective uh, you know, the best of, of the works, because you've won a prize and you want to show off why you won the prize. I took the opposite tact and treated it as an experiment. And so I showed the newest works, and the newest works were the breathers. And so on the left at the Guggenheim, I showed the, publicly for the first time one of the breathers, a piece called Tetra Gummy Phone, which used four 18-inch fans uh, to come off the wall. And I loved it. Um, people, I thought, found it curious because they had never seen this work before from me and wondered why I got the award, I'm sure. Um, that summer, I showed in uh, Hydra, an island uh, in Greece, at the Deste Slaughterhouse Art Space. And I showed the second breather, which is a composition of three um, breathers that I designed with uh, actual blower fans that the sky dancers use. And this piece is called Hippias Minor. Uh, for those of you who are fans of Plato, and who is really, uh, Hippias Minor is one of his early dialogues. It's a completely interesting one. It's a very short dialogue written by Plato, and it's curious because it's one of the f it's one of the dialogues where uh, nothing kind of makes sense, and it mostly doesn't make sense because in Hippias Minor, Plato um, uses Socrates to talk about why a liar is better than a truth teller which is shocking for Plato, who is one of the greatest philosophers of social justice and truth there is. Uh, I won't go into it. It's a completely interesting book. My press, Badlands Unlimited, um, published a new translation of Hippias Minor to go along with this exhibition. And so it showed on an island uh, in, a, in a small building, out, outcropped building, 
on dust day, um, and it showed from uh, dust till, I mean dawn till dusk, or depending upon weather conditions. I think um, the fullest manifestation of the breathers happened just last year. These are very new works. Uh, this was uh, shown uh, at a show at Green of Tally Gallery in New York, and the title of the show is called Reanima, which is a, a play off of Aristotle's uh, uh, a book called De Anima. Uh, Aristotle uh, famously in De Anima talked about, De Anima is the spirit, roughly translated in ancient Greek. And in De Anima, uh, Aristotle talks about the relationship between what we call the spirit and breath, pneumia. Um, and so for Aristotle, there's a vital relationship between what we consider spirit and breath and wind. And I thought it was very moving. I'm not even a fan of Aristotle, but I was very moved by what he said because it was what I was doing. I was making these breathers. And so uh, let me just show you some short clips of the breathers that are in uh, the Reanima show at Green of Tali last year. This is Pentasophia. Eighteen inch fans. It's like witches praying for the end of the world or the beginning of one, I'm not sure. This is Madonna with Childs. This is a Ku Klux Klan mother dragging her clan kids to a rally. Or her two clan kids trying to hold her back from the rally, I'm not sure. This is Bathers with Nothing. This is the first Bathers I made. It premiered at Green of Tali. And this was, for me, uh, conceptually, the last piece of this show. And it's the last piece because it's what I would, that would, it's the baton that I would carry forth. And you can see the echoes of it, the floor composition, um, the scale. Pentasophia and Madonna with Childs are slightly larger. Uh, I made them very um, sensitive to scale. And, and it was true with video, with the video work. I refused to scale my videos so that it overwhelmed you. I needed to be proportional to a human body. And so these are the same. So with Pentasophia and Madonna Childs, they're slightly larger than human body, so they slightly feel iconic slightly feel a little more menacing. With the bathers, like this one, they're more human size, uh, like downstairs. There's just a slight shift of scale. After the Green of Tali show, um, I went back to the bender. I'd forgotten about it since 2013, November 2013. I'd gone on to do R&D so that I can create those works, but I never forgot bender. And so after the Reanima show, after the Green of Tali sh show closed in May of last year, I think, I returned to it. Um, I had to go back to the bender. I didn't forget you. This is the first pattern I designed for bender. After learning all that, um, winging it really, uh, in pattern making and in physics and in design. I think a much better pattern than before, I think. It looks more professional anyways. Patterns are funny. I don't know how to do them. <laughs> I don't know how to do anything. Um, and so what you do is you draw the pattern, you print it out, you cut the fabric based on the pattern, you sew it, put it on a fan and see how it flies. Um, we call it flying when we strap the fabric a piece onto a fan and see how it goes. And uh, so after a first couple times of the patterns, this is the first prototype we make. There are around, um, I would say, four to five patterns per prototype. So different variations of the pattern before it becomes a prototype. And so um, the count for bender is around 42 to 43 patterns. We had to design 43 patterns before we got it right. And so this is the first prototype. Does nothing. It's 
too heavy on top. The holes are wrong. The silhouette is wrong. Uh, the arm is too heavy, and there's no movement. I mean, besides the shaking, which is a movement as far as I'm concerned, but it doesn't move the way that I want it to, what I imagined it. Um, and, so, uh, and so we had to go back to the drawing board. Um, what I like, though, what I learned from this one, though, is the scale. Um, that the height of this one, which was around five, uh, five feet, six inches, five feet, seven inches, was right visually for me. And so at the very least, I understood the proportion that I needed. Um, but I didn't get the animation at all or the shape. And so back to the drawing board, back to more patterns. Why bathers? Um, it's a good question. Uh, you know, I call the whole project breathers because they're breathing works. But now I'm making a subset of the breathers called the bathers. And uh, one of the questions is, why bathers? Um, and uh, it's a good question because I don't even like to swim. Uh, I don't get in the water much. So I'm not a real swimmer. Uh, and um, bathing and being on the beach or the natural accoutrements of bathing is not something I am used to or even think about as something pleasurable. Um, but I found in the motif of bathers and bathing in art really interesting at the time, still do. And I think mostly it's because maybe uh, it's the scale of the bodies, it's the relationship between nudity and clothes, and also there is a quality of bathers that, um, that connects sensuality and sensuousness with a certain understanding of societal changes. Bathers as a motif in American in, in, in art um, has an interesting convergence between critique and pleasure. Because bathers were one of the ways that artists talked about how society was changing, how our relationship to nature was changing, and what that meant. Uh, I think if you look at Cezanne, if you look at Matisse, you can see that. And so I thought using the motif of bathers would be an interesting way of making bodies animated, uh, either clothed or nude, to talk about changing roles of nature in society, broadly speaking. Uh, the bathers at night downstairs is in fact derived in part from uh, Cezanne's large bathers at the barns. And I took some time uh, looking at them. It, it, it gave me an excuse to look at uh, the bathers, the bathers motif, especially in Cezanne. And um, not especially Cezanne, but uh, Cezanne and Matisse. I love Matisse. Uh, I think uh, he is uh, one of the greatest artists who ever lived. Late Matisse is something that I think is profoundly moving to me. Uh, this is sort of middle Matisse. The cutouts are my favorite, um, but this is joy to life. Um, with Cezanne and Matisse, one of the things that was enriching for me and insightful also is that they didn't make a fetish of how the body looked. They weren't Bougereau or Delacroix. They didn't have to make the bod human body so idealized and romanticized so that it's essentially a kind of voyeurism in staring at a naked body. They were willing to expand the notion of erotica and pleasure so that the body may not look mimetically real, but that had some sort of sensuality in terms of line quality and color, so that it exuded eroticism and pleasure without having to be pornographic. And I found that very instructive, because the breathers, when I make them, they can't be idealized bodies, because it won't work. I need them to be abstract, because air pressure forces it to be a kind of streamlined, abstract form. And so by necessity, I have to make abstract bodies. So the question is, how do you make abstract bodies sensuous and real and moving at the same time as it exudes a certain quality of humanity? I think that's the challenge for me. Another influence, Carol Dunham, uh, a New York painter, arguably to me, one of the greatest painters alive. Uh, I am biased because I published his book. Uh, Carol Dunham is an astute painter, but also a great writer who's been writing about um, art for decades. 
And um, my press, Badlands Unlimited, published his collection of writings last year called Into Words. And um, it just so happened that Tip, as friends call him, also did a body of work on the bathers. And I found them uh, incredible. They're just jaw-dropping. They're just crazy paintings. No one paints like Tip. And I really appreciated the boldness, the provocation, the color, and the forms. And I learned a lot from Tip's paintings. The last element in the constellation of bathers are pictures of, not pictures, just news of refugees. I think when we think contemporarily of bathers, I think of people washing up on the shores of Europe and refugees from Syria and other places washing up and these pictures, news pictures, of bikini-cladded uh, 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 men and women uh, on the same beach as people washing up on shore from boats and the contrast and the contradiction between these two images. And that's as contemporary to me as it gets. And so one of the challenges of the bathers is to be able to create a space so that that contradiction can be articulated, can be made manifest, and to be made moving. And so within these elements uh, are uh, the stars within the constellation, what became the Bathers Project, which will continue to be the Bathers Project until I get tired of it. It's one of the uh, best pictures I've seen online of, uh, of um, uh, the continuing refugee crisis in Europe. Another prototype. Prototype three, what does that say? I didn't read it. Closer, there's movement. Um, neckline's different. It's, uh, as I remember it, 35 inches. Uh, I lessen the weight of the arm so that they can swing, but the real breakthrough is the, is the waist. You see how the waist now, instead of just being a straight tube, has this cut in it, this dart. And this dart is what allows it to bend, right, like a hip. And so now I've gotten somewhere. Also, um, the silhouette changed. The first prototype was straighter. This silhouette has a curve in here, which forces the air into this area once the air goes into this area, so with air, the, the, tighter the, the, the tighter the tube or the container is, the faster the air goes. And so by making the silhouette go in, I make the air go faster here and hits this area. And once this hits this area, turbulence is created. Air can no longer go in the same direction, and it creates turbulence, like what you have on planes. Turbulence is when air goes different directions and created, um, creates friction. And so creating turbulence here allows this area to be heavier and heavier and lighter, depending upon how fast air escapes from here. And so that's what created that animation. And now the question is, how much weight do you put on the arms to control the weight of how it goes forward or backwards? This one is um, not right because it's bending back too far. No one bends back like that unless their back is broken. And it's not a person but it has to move like someone I care about. And so it's not right. This is a picture of my inhaler. I think one of the reasons why I held on to Bender so much is um, because um, it reminded me of uh, 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 asthma attacks. Um, and air, is important for everyone, arguably, right? Uh, and uh, like I said, the ancient Greeks had a really interesting relationship in understanding how air becomes spirit, becomes life. Numea roughly translates as spirit or the vital principle by which a body's animated, more or less like us. And numea can mean spirit or wind or breath. And it made perfect sense for me conceptually. It was elegant to think about the works as breathers, as powered by Numea, and uh, if I do think that way, then uh, it would make sense that I would be attracted to the one that had trouble breathing. 
that had trouble animating, that was bent over as if it's having an asthma attack. Because that's what I have. Does anyone have asthma here? Oh, yeah. Love you. Right? We should have a mailing list or something. Is there an asthmatic softball team? Is there such a thing? I don't know. They'd be a terrible team. Have to constantly use our inhaler. We can't play in allergy season. We'd have to play just in the winter or the depth of summer. Still not right. Too heavy. But notice the, the, the indentations in the front. So of course, once I figure out one thing, one divot works, why not put in more divots in the front to see how it works? And so we put in more to see how it works. I also tried to extend the arms and extended the neckline so that it's bigger. Not right, too heavy, and the divots didn't do the kind of emotion that I was looking for. The interesting thing about the breathers is that it's actually harder to create um, limited movements. Uh, it's easier to create wild movements. Like those sky dancers that you see at used car dealerships, they have no control. There's just enough air pressure for them to stay up, so they go willy-nilly. It's actually very difficult, in my experience, to actually just control the breather so it just does this, instead of just going like this. And that's the challenge, to find an internal architecture so it allows it to just do this. This is your building. This is how I see it. Um, I'm nearsighted. I realize now I'm just telling you everything that's wrong with me medically. <laughs> I feel like this is like a... Did you guys have a doctor's conference two years ago? I should have been there. Um, I'm nearsighted. Uh, I should be wearing my glasses. You're blurry to me. And, uh, and uh, so this is how the museum looks to me from a certain vantage point uh, beyond the flagpoles. What are those things exactly? The white poles? Are they flagpoles? No one knows. OK. Um, so anyways, as I'm there, this is what the building looks like to me. Um, I'm telling you this because um, what's most important to me about the breathers isn't actually how they look, but how they move. And the reason why that is is because um, when I was young, 11 or 12, I was diagnosed with nearsightedness, and I'm supposed to wear glasses. But I refused to wear glasses because I was too vain. I thought I looked ugly in glasses. And I think when you're 11 or 12, you don't want anything to make you look any more ugly. And so I didn't wear them. I just refused to wear them. I, I would hide them in the drawer or closet, and I refused to wear them. And it was not so much, not troublesome, because I wasn't driving at the time, although I do drive without my glasses. Anyways. What was interesting was that I learned how to see without um, uh, the world being sharp. That I adapted in such a way because of my vanity, because of my stubbornness and vanity, um, so that I felt like I could see, and in fact I do see, without having to see things sharply. Uh, and it's because we, I can recognize people, I think, based on how they move as much as what they look like. That I, I think I can recognize my friends, or Nick or Alexa who works for me, down the street, because of not how they look, but how they move. So movement became a signature for me for recognizing things. So my eyes essentially, and my mind essentially, adapted to the fact that I couldn't see sharply by, uh, by outsourcing the capacity to recognize things through their movement. And so that's why movement is so important to me, because essentially that's how I see. The early video work I was making uh, was full of color and shapes, but in many ways, it was irrelevant to me. I was indifferent to it. It was simply how they moved over time and the polyphony of rhythms and shapes that moved that captured my attention. It didn't kind of matter what they were, whether they were flowers or trees or clouds or little girls with penises. It was the movement that mattered, which is why the breathers made sense to me, because it wasn't about it, the shape. It is, but it isn't. It's about the movement, and that's how I felt like I cheated fate, because I, I can now figure out how to make movement without having to stare at a screen at all. And it's not true. I, the patterns are made on the computer. And frankly, I think I stare at a computer screen as much 
now as I do then. But I don't have to look at a screen for the work to manifest itself. And I think that is the greatest gift, really. Breakthrough. Prototype 5. October. I've been making them from September, October. It'll lead into January, March. But this was the real breakthrough piece. This is the movement I was looking for. The, the, the lateral movement, the controlled movement of up and down, the flow of the body as it moves. And it's all because of these, the bumpy back. The three bumps in the back that allows the air to go in and out, and in air going in and out of those bumps creates the turbulence that allows for this movement to exist. And this came because of a goof. Remember, the first prototype I made, the bumps were in the front, because I thought that's where the bend had to be. But I turned it around and realized that was actually the secret. So by turning the body backwards, it actually worked. A lot of times, it's a goof. It's a lot of times, it's a lot of saying, fuck it, let's just try this. And you just, just works. I was very excited about this one. This was a very good prototype. Let's add to it. Prototype six. Bumps are in there. Now I add the towel. Because the towel adds just enough weight, 12.3 grams, to limit the animation so that it does just enough for me. Bumps are there. But then the towel becomes the counterweight, right? It's like a sinker for a fishing line. And now the question is, how heavy is the towel so that I can control the, this movement? The neckline's refined, but the movement is close, much closer. I painted that towel. I, all I do is paint cheesy towels now. They all have smiley faces. Like these. <laughs> um, for me to think about the shapes, I need to draw. And so I do drawings, I do pastels, and I started uh, making these towels. The bender shape is that towel on the left. And so I use these top, what I call towel works as a way to imagine and to manifest and express the shapes and the patterns that I use to animate. And they're not sketches, they're works in their own right, and they exist within the constellation of the idea of bathers insofar as they're towels. Bathers need towels, and I wanted to make towels. I also make clothes for them, and so on bathers at night downstairs, you'll see shorts on the floor, and they fit the bathers. Um, and I also designed the fabrics because uh, I have no life and this is all I do. <laughs> um, to the right, you see upside down is uh, the pattern for Kim and Chloe. Pattern eight, the drama. Doesn't work. Too heavy, I, uh, I adjusted the back, didn't work. Also, I added um, uh, something called marrowing. Marrowing is where you basically um, protect the seam on the inside uh, of the body, and it added too much weight. Also, I added this panel in the back, the extra panel that you saw that you open, and there was too much air rushing into the back, which forced it to bend backwards like that. I, it was too much, and uh, it didn't work. So I took out the panels, added weight, counterweight, and this is very, very close. This is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a bather that is tired, possibly having a heart attack or an asthma attack, trying to carry their towels back home.
I adjusted, uh, adjusted the bumpy back, and it, it just works. A mere quarter of an inch changes the animation. And a gram can change the animation. But this is about right. So finally, the final piece. This is a 1.0 Hyper D purple fabric. I don't know why. I mean, that's the technical name for it. The shape is done. There are other compositions on the floor that I want to make, that I want to make. I love that part. And it's just right. After um, 40 patterns. Um, I also don't know uh, the title of it. And so I'm going to open up tonight. So if anyone has any ideas of a good title for this, you should let me know during the Q&A section. And if I like the title, I'll name the piece based on what you suggest and name it after you. I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, the last thing I'd like to show you is um, just a short video documentation of bathers at night, so around a minute. Um, you know, I don't know how you make work or how you do things when you run, but I'm sure we all listen to music uh, when we make things or do things. And uh, certainly for me, there's an internal soundtrack for how I make things. And so there's a long list of songs I was listening to when I was making bathers at night. So I'm just gonna show you a quick clip of one of the songs along with a video documentation of what you can see downstairs because there's no soundtrack playing downstairs. So essentially you're in my mind when you watch this for a minute. Thank you.